Hi there, we're on the banks of the Colorado River in the Fisher Towers section. We're on ancestral tribal land for the Ute and Paiute Native American groups. We're walking through a pipeline right now to a pretty cool spot that you'll see in just about a moment. We're approximately 21 miles away from the city limits of Moab, Utah. The weather's fair. It's about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. We're at an elevation of about 4,600 feet, and we are walking among the Moenkopi layer of sandstone out here. There's tons of rock art out here, so let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about rock art of the Greater Southwest, a 2015 publication by Edwin C. Krupp. It's in a handbook of archaeoastronomy and ethnoastronomy. Here in the Southwest of the United States of America, there's tons of rock art. It's mostly been preserved thanks to the arid climate here. It doesn't rain very much, so there's not much water to wash the drawings off of cliff faces. And for that reason, a lot of the original drawings have survived. They're on the rocks here, usually inside dwellings. But first, what is rock art? It's also called petroglyphs. They're generally native or ancestral drawings, usually done on cliff faces or the dwellings that we mentioned and they can tell a story. They usually depict animals or humans, and sometimes, if we're very fortunate, you can find a site that depicts something about astronomy. We're headed to a place called Rubik's Cube right now, which is... Down. Towards you. Up, up, up. Now, just like angle your finger down. Perfect. It's right there. Let's go. A quick note about hydration and some other things. The Paiute group, which was here a long time ago, they used to sort of be looked down upon by some of the other native groups, uh, mostly the Utes and the Sioux Native Americans, because they weren't as wealthy, because the desert southwest, specifically in this region, doesn't have a lot of plants that you can do things with. Many have lots of uses and they certainly survive well, but compared to the native groups that were further north in bigger forests, they were not very wealthy because the further north you go, the more trees there are and the more resources there are. So you have to spend less time looking for food and you can spend more time making things to trade, more time making art and jewelry and thus being wealthier. And there are a few plants that were very important to the Ute and Paiutes here. We have one right here. This is called cow parsley or salt brush. And this is essentially Gatorade for animals. The deer and the cows love this stuff, and it's great to replenish your electrolytes if you're stuck out in the desert, you can chew it. It's very salty and it actually sequesters much of the salt that comes from our soil here. We have one other plant right over here. And a lot of folks still eat this today. This is buckwheat, which the Paiutes used to grind up, and you can actually make it right into a pretty delicious flour. And if you had farm out, farmhouse pancakes at a restaurant, it's, there's a pretty high chance that it had buckwheat flour made from the buckwheat plant in it. Let's keep going. <laughs> quite a remarkable area. Behind me to my left and to your right we have the Fisher Towers. Among them is the Titan. It's the kind of Lysol shaped one. I'll put an arrow to it though, but it's the world's second tallest freestanding sandstone structure. There's one that beats it by about 12 feet and that's in Kenya. But we're not really here to talk about that. We're here to talk about William C. Miller who really got the ball rolling on ethno-astrological science in around 1955. He was going around checking out all this rock art and the petroglyphs and he started to see a pattern where there were stars, and there's one particular picture that really got it all started. I'll put it up right here, but it's a picture of a crescent moon next to some circular object that he thought was a star. And he thought that this may have predicted or depicted the crab supernova, which happened around 1000 AD. And we know that it happened around that time because official astronomers on the eastern side of the continent of Asia, Asia actually talked about it and they actually cataloged it they were ready for it and they wrote it down so we know that that actually happened in that year but the debate is whether William C. Miller's depictions in the rock art here also depicted that and that's still up for debate today. The photographs and report by William C. Miller depicting the rock art that directly correlates to the crab supernova or supposedly so started a rock art hunting frenzy in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And while we're here, I want to point out Periot Mesa, that huge mesa right over there. That's a big point of contention here in Moab, Utah. Most of the guides, when they 
they take you out on the land, they'll tell you about the Moab Hospital. And this part's true. The Moab Hospital has a map where if you come into the hospital with a tourism or a recreation related injury, you put a pin on the map as to where your injury occurred and what kind of injury it was. Marriott Mesa is an important native site here and it's also a very popular climbing spot. And nowhere else in all of Moab has more pins than this mesa right here. And the point of contention is this. When the guides tell you this, they'll tell you that it's because it has a native curse on it from the UK. And honestly, that's pretty offensive. And although it's an important site, that doesn't mean that it has a curse on it. I was shown this spot by friends. It's not on Google if you go to look for it. It's not even in most of the guidebooks. But that doesn't mean that people don't come here to destroy it. And this sign right here. Almost 20 sites that depicted the Crab Nebula had been cataloged, and they were under consistent review and scrutiny by many other ethno-astronomers. In fact, by 2005, all of the sites that had previously been discovered had been reviewed, and it was determined that none of them actually depicted the Crab Supernova. And this was for quite a few reasons, one of the main reasons being that many of the photographs that our boy Miller took actually were just smaller sections of larger pictures. By this I mean it would have been an entire wall of images depicting a scene. It could have been somebody hunting and there were stars above him and Miller chose to photograph only the stars above, remove it from the context, and then claim that it depicted this specific supernova in many different sites. And that seems a little bit disingenuous and not exactly true to the scientific process. And in addition to that, many of the sites that he cataloged, folks tried to go back and verify his research and either the sites had never existed, the rock art was gone, or the sites were never there in the first place because although Miller was able to provide specific coordinates, these new scientists that were researching his previous work from an objective perspective arrived at these sites and there was just nothing there. So with that and Miller's death in the late 1970s, it marked an end to the Crab Supernova rock art conspiracy. Although this is flash flood country, there are tons of awesome caves and protected environments. This is a place that you would want to live if you were looking for shelter in this region. And in addition to that, the Colorado River is less than a mile away, so you would have access to water and access to all these plants, some of which we pointed out on the way here. And I think it's very important to remember our ancestors and remember that they were people like us too. They had personal projects, they got bored. And what have humans always done when we got bored? We've made art. And here we have some wonderful rock art up here depicting some antelope, maybe a mother and a father, and then over here, perhaps a little baby. All over here, you can see some nice chisel work. And this looks like a person right here, his arms in the air. Pretty cool. So you can see by the red color in this sandstone right here, it's largely composed of oxidized iron. And we do have another little piece of rock art right here, perhaps an arrow. And if you get your hand and you slap it, you can hear that nice slapping sound. And that means that it's the Moenkopi layer of sandstone. It's about 285 million years and two weeks old. What do you mean two weeks? Well, we came up here two weeks ago and it was 285 million years old then. So you do the math. Oh. So with the end of that chapter with William C. Miller, a new chapter began where ethno-astronomers began looking for rock art, generally inside of dwellings because there were 
walls around the sides that depicted something with the celestial calendar, generally with equinoxes or solstices. In this image by the author, you can see that there is a dagger of light that points toward the head of a red-horned figure that's painted on the wall of the dwelling, which is pretty awesome. But what's more interesting is that it only happens in the sunrise of the winter solstice every year. All other times of the year, that dagger of light is in a different place. Really, really cool. And something else fascinating over here, we have some more rock art. Whoever was living here really loved antelope. Check this guy out. And then we've got what was maybe a bird over here. And then we've got a whole herd of antelopes here. And then right over here, we've got what kind of looks like a cairn, just a, a stacking of rocks. And then it goes up and there's little horns at the top. So maybe it's a caterpillar. But what's pretty cool is that this kind of looks like a strand of DNA. And then over here, we've got a chromosome, which is pretty cool. Maybe a little bit modern for the time that this was created, but hey, who's to say? And then over here, this is my favorite part uh, that we found so far. It's what looks like some folks dancing on mountaintops. And then we've got a little lizard right here. This is just amazing, folks. A little lizard and then maybe a mushroom and then more antelope and then a bigger antelope. And then the chungus of all antelopes. <laughs> this thing is like two feet across. That thing's huge. And then there's more lizards and antelopes going all the way back there. I mean, that's just so cool that people used to do this for fun and it's still here. Awesome. Because the way that the light and the stars interacted with the rock art inside these specific dwellings, you had to be there at a certain time of day and a certain time of the year in order to see the results that may or may not actually be there. So as I'm sure you can imagine, it took these ethno-astronomers a very long time to compile this data because there was just so much testing. Every single piece of rock art inside a dwelling that they thought might line up with something to do with the celestial sky, they had to test it not only every day of the year, but every hour to see if it lined up with specific constellations or maybe specific features of the night sky, maybe the sun, or maybe the way that the sunlight entered the building at a certain hour of the day. And so for that reason, most of these searches were limited to the dwellings because they had the walls that I, was, that I mentioned earlier. And they used an early form of cement to kind of put these flat pieces of sandstone together. And so there was plenty of opportunity to make shapes in the wall, but it's kind of a compromise for our early ancestors when they wanted to do that. Do you want a well insulated building or do you want a hole in the wall that depicts some sort of celestial information? And lucky for us, many of our ancestors chose the latter. I also want to point out just how close we are to the Colorado River. You can see some shininess over there and some green parts. It's really not a far walk at all. And I think this would be a really nice place to live. And I think some of our earlier ancestors thought so too. And back onto the rock art in the sun and the stars. In Fajada Butte in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, there is a spiral carving. Here's an image of it. But at specific points in the year, four specific points to be exact, in the fall equinox, the spring equinox, the winter solstice, and the summer solstice, certain arrows came on top of this spiral carving in the rock face and depicted specific designs. We don't have an exact meaning as to what these designs meant, but we know that they were probably intentional. Something like this doesn't really happen to be a coincidence. And during the second frenzied phase, many archaeologists, astronomers, ethno-astronomers all teamed up and they actually moved to the American Southwest to look specifically for this rock art as teams. And since this process was so intensive, they started adopting strategies where they would come out and they would go to the dwelling specifically at times where they predicted that there might be some sort of projections on the walls with sunlight or some windows that might point to specific constellations in the years. And most commonly this would be on a summer or even more commonly the winter solstice. You may be wondering, well, what exactly is a solstice? Well, I'll tell you. It comes from the Latin word for sun, sol, and the Latin word for to stand still or sistir. Sol, sistir, solstice. And it means that the sun 
stays rather stagnant in a limit in the northern or southern sky and the declination is halted for that time and then it will reverse direction. And this occurs twice a year, once in the summer, June 21st, and once in the winter, December 21st. And you'll notice that these are exactly six months apart. And at that point in the summer, that is the day with the most sunlight, or, well, usually. It depends on the cloud cover, though. And in the winter, December 21st, that is the day with the least amount of sunlight. The celestial year here on Earth is 12 months. Humans have always divided the seasons into three-month periods, starting with the solstices. The winter solstice begins the winter season, the summer solstice begins the summer season. But for fall and spring, we have equinoxes, the fall equinox and the spring equinox. This comes from the Latin aqueus and noctis, or equinox equal night. And that means that the day and night have the same amount of hours in the day, or the sun spends the same time amount as the same amount of time above the horizon as it does below the horizon. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you learned a lot about ethnoastronomy, about equinoxes, solstices, and thanks for checking out this cool rock art with me. Thanks for Emma for filming, and thank you, Mark, for teaching such an awesome class. I hope you all have fun and you're enjoying Arizona. See you soon, stay hungry, and uh, get outside and find some rock art. 2015 publication by Edwin C. Krupp. It's in a handbook of ethno-archaeology, and that was wrong. Let's turn around. <laughs> what did I say? Ethno-archaeology? <laughs> yeah, it said ethno-astronomy and archaeological astronomy. Today we're going to be talking about a handbook of uh, wait. <laughs> Rock art of the Greater American South. <laughs> Hi there. We're... This is ancestral. <laughs> ancestral. Ancestral. Tons of rock art out here. So let's get started. <laughs> I actually used to get some flack for that. They used to get to me. Get some flack for that, bro. And you can see that it's starting to crumble in some places. That should be just because it's getting wet. You're supposed to say. I forgot. <laughs> you kept talking too fast. So uh, get outside and find some rock art. I don't think that's it. We're too low. <laughs> Gotta go about 500 feet higher for that. This is the wrong plant. <laughs> it looks similar though. And the solstices happen every six months, twice a year. But there are four seasons. They change every three months. And other than the solstices, did I say that twice? <laughs> you said every three months. <laughs> <laughs> and there are generally four seasons. And <laughs> Celestial year here. <laughs> <laughs> A celestial year here on Earth is 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to look away. Every three months, the seasons change, or most humans would say. <laughs> <laughs> celestial year here on Earth is 12 months. Typically, humans have divided the months. What? <laughs>